I'm going to build a house from scratch, almost entirely on my own and with no house building experience. What could possibly go wrong? Hi, I'm Kurt Granroth from Granroth's Workshop and you're watching the first episode in a new series that will detail my efforts to build a small house with no prior experience doing so. Expect to see a lot of mistakes along the way. This is going to be a 750 square foot guest house located in the back of my property. Yes, I am planning on building as much of it as possible entirely by myself, but I do intend to hire professionals where specific skills are required, where code essentially dictates it, or if I simply don't want to do the task for any number of reasons. For example, if a task is time sensitive, then there's a higher likelihood of hiring a pro crew since, well, I'm a novice at literally everything about this and thus work very, very slowly. Also, I'm kind of lazy. And so if the job requires a lot of back-breaking labor, then I'll likely farm that out too. But if it is interesting work or is work that can be done over an extended period of time, then I'll definitely take it on. Believe it or not, that actually describes the vast majority of work involved in building a house since, well, the missing component is skill and I'll just pick up the skill as I go. Seriously. So why build a house myself? Well, I've been watching shows like This Old House and Home Time for decades and have since moved on to subscribing to scores of builder channels. I have a driving need to build a house myself at least once in my life. And well, this is finally my chance. Saving money is certainly a factor since this will be substantially cheaper than hiring a general contractor, but money is absolutely secondary to just the internal drive to build. One more thing to note. In this video, and likely the next few, I will likely switch between referring to the house build in the past tense and in the future tense. That's because I actually started all this well over a year ago. And <laughs> it's only been now that I got around to create videos on it. At this very moment, I'm actually finishing up on the roofing. If you want to see things happen more in real time, then I suggest following me on Instagram at Grandworks since I post there pretty regularly. Okay, on to some of the details. It was important for me to realize that projects of this scope are defined more by their constraints than by their choices. That is to say, there are a near infinite number of houses that could be built in a near infinite number of ways if the choices are truly open-ended. Having such wide open choices isn't freeing to me. It's crippling. Decision paralysis is a near certainty in my case without solid constraints. So my first step was to create a set of requirements for the house that will be the bedrock of all future decisions. I started with this mission statement of sorts for the design itself. This design is for a small house that will be built in the backyard of a home in Phoenix, Arizona as a guest house for use by a retired couple. Simple. But that alone gets rid of countless possible options. Given that, I further broke it down into four overarching goals upon which all other decisions must follow. One, it must be super energy efficient. Two, it must follow universal design or ADA principles. Three, it must be bright and airy. And four, it must be small and compact. This house should be extremely energy efficient to the point that it might even be a truly passive home requiring no energy source to heat or cool the place if that was possible here in Phoenix. Spoiler, it's not possible. Getting to net zero with just a few solar panels eh, should be no problem at all though. Okay, but let's take a step back and recognize that you can't separate the energy design of a home from the climate that it sits in. What works well in Alaska is hardly suited for the polar opposite conditions that exist here and vice versa. We live in Phoenix, Arizona in the Sonoran Desert. It's known as the Valley of the Sun as it is overwhelmingly sunny year round. And that's not an exaggeration. Phoenix is literally the sunniest major city on earth. You can count on seeing the sun for 3,872 hours every year spread out over 300 days on average. It rarely rains with an annual average of about eight inches. Most of that concentrated in the winter and in the July and August monsoon months. Although, not this particular monsoon, which was even more dry than normal. Summer temperatures peak in the 115 to 120 degree range with overnight lows 80 degrees and above. Apparently now in 2020, we broke the all time record for number of days with a high above 100 degrees. And that's 144 days. 
almost five straight months. That's in addition to the record number of 110 degree days, 53, and the record number of 115 degree and above days, 14. So yeah, it's very, very hot here. And better believe I felt every one of those record breaking days while building this house. Eesh. Winters, on the other hand, are short and very mild. It essentially never snows, and we might dip down into freezing temperatures overnight a handful of days a year at most. Phoenix is also almost entirely immune to natural disasters other than extreme heat and fires. There are no hurricanes or cyclones. Tornadoes are super rare and very small when they do happen. Any earthquakes simply can't be felt. And while certain areas do flood during the monsoons, those floods are highly localized and managed via washes. They're not a problem at all. So if we look at the climate we're dealing with, we see that the need to cool a home dominates any energy calculation with the need to heat almost an afterthought. And to address that, the need to block the sun and to keep out the heat in the first place is overwhelmingly the biggest goal. As an aside, the emphasis on cooling versus heating does mean that it's physically impossible for this house to heat and cool truly passively. Um, I think I'm going to talk about that more in a future video. To help with this, all windows and doors must be in complete shade during the hottest part of the day, and at least partially shaded at all times. A big part of that will be the wraparound porches covering the entire north and west sides and most of the south. The east side has no windows or doors at all, and is mostly shaded by large trees in the morning. Cooling and heating will be done using a super high efficiency mini split heat pump. I go into the full energy requirements in the article on the Groundworks website if you do want more details. I'm a big proponent of universal design or designing a home that is usable by anybody regardless of ability or disability. I simply don't understand why you would design a home that limits who can actually live there. The fact that the house will be for a retired couple doesn't make it convenient that this is a design goal. But honestly, I'd be going into universal design even if I was the one that was going to be living there. The biggest broad stroke for this will be ensuring that the floors, shower, door thresholds, and patios are all flat and on the same plane, so that you can get to any part of the house by rolling, or even by walking without picking up your feet at all. That does require careful planning in some cases. Next up are the simple things, like ensuring that all doors be at least 36 inches wide, and any door handles be levers, and stuff like that. Specifically, I will be designing the bathroom and kitchen to match ADA standards for accessible design. And concretely, this will be by following the NKBA standards on specific dimensions and offsets and the stuff like that. Small homes have the tendency to be dark caves in the best of cases, and the extensive patios and shading techniques used in this house have a potential to make this worse. Thus, ensuring that this ends up bright and airy means it needs to be a top-level design goal. First up, this means higher ceilings in the main living area, either a vaulted ceiling or a raised one, then ample space between objects in the room, even given the limited space of a small house. Colors will be light throughout as well. And then there will be a lot of glass in the form of doors and windows. The north patio alone will have a wall of glass for the main room, preferably in the form of an inside-outside, movable wall-style door, either folding or sliding or something like that. In fact, the surface of the north wall will be just over 40% glass to 60% solid siding. This can have the potential of conflicting with extreme energy efficiency requirements, but I ran the numbers in an energy modeling app and we should be fine. I will be covering that in a future video. This is important enough to be one of the four guiding principles, but it is the least important of those four. That is, this needs to be small and with little to no wasted space, but it can't sacrifice energy efficiency, universal design, or a bright and airy feeling to achieve that. Given the high level requirements, I can further break down the primary constraints. One, it'll be 800 square feet maximum and maybe double that with the full footprint, including the patios. Two, it will be a single story on concrete slab. Three, it'll have a kitchen, a living room, a bathroom, and a bedroom, at least. Four, it'll have a 512 roof pitch to match the existing house. Now, that ended up being 412. That's a long story that I'll get into later. Five, it'll have a hip roof to match the existing house due to planning restrictions. 
That constraint ended up being super frustrating, as you'll see as the series progresses. Six, it'll have a vaulted or raised ceiling in the living area, but flat over the bedroom and bathroom area, based on the bright and airy goal and client request. Seven, it'll be largely rectangular and oriented east-west. That's the best match considering the existing property. Eight, it'll have a wraparound porch covering the north, west, and south facades. And this is a big part of the energy efficiency. Nine, it must be visually compatible with the main house. This one constraint was due to a fundamental misunderstanding of the town's planning requirements and caused no end of trouble during the design phase. It added months to the design phase. Eesh. These requirements and constraints were broken down even further, and those were the ones that I sent to my architect so we could start iterating on a design. If you want to see all of those details, then check out the article on the Grandworks website. Okay, next up is the planning and permit process. After that, we'll cover the energy modeling, and then we'll get into the engineering part of this, and then we'll go over what kind of plans that you'll have and how to interpret them. It wasn't obvious to me. And only after all of that will we start on the actual build. As I mentioned before, if you want to see this happen in real time, then check me out on Instagram at Grandworks. I post stories nearly every day I work on the house, and regular posts happen relatively frequently. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to comment below. I do read all comments in my videos and respond to all questions. And thank you so much for watching.